Hello and welcome to At The 55, your home for OUA football. Me and Tom are back on the mics with your week one review pod where we're going to go over the five games we have on the opening weekend of the OUA season. Tom, we've been talking about all these 11 teams now for the past week. If you've been tuning into our preview pods going through the tiers E through A, we appreciate you. As always, we've been talking about these teams, what we've expected in terms of who's coming back, new faces in some new places. Now we get to put these teams up against one another and start to talk about how we think these changes or lack thereof are going to start adding up in the wins or loss column. Tom, let's get into all these things. But first, may I just say... How the heck are you doing, my friend? <laughs> it's here. It's finally here. We've been talking about all of these hypotheticals and where we could be or couldn't be. We're finally at week one. Oh, I'm so excited to finally be back doing this. As always, it's a pleasure to be talking with you, Zach Bader Shamai, about everything that we're doing. But now football is back. It's here. Um, and uh, really, I don't think there's any other preamble we need to get into <laughs> other than just to say, L- let's go. Uh, this is mm-hmm. this is what we wait for all year long. So let's get it started with a, a game that you and I, Tom, will be in the house for in the Royal City. It's the Carlton Ravens traveling to Guelph to take on the Guelph Griffins. Now, before we get into who we think or probably what we think the outcome of this game is going to be and just the different machinations with these two clubs and where they're at. Um, Since we did our, well, I guess both these clubs fell into our tier C, the step up or step Mm -hmm. off. And, you know, there's a few other matchups, at least one other matchup where we get to see two teams that we had in the same tier do battle, which will be nice to sort of validate or give us new information. Um, But since that pod, there's been a couple updates that we will actually make for a few of these games. Um, Carlton, you still don't have your new roster up. Come on, do better. Um, (laughs) For Guelph, though, a couple big names have come to our attention, both as far as guys that are back and in specific about one guy who is not back. Um, All this, I believe, takes place on the defensive side of the ball. Um, And I'll start off. I'll just name off some names. We'll get into it. Uh, Scott Murray is not back on this roster. That's a big blow to that defensive line, to that defense as a whole. And just, again, his impact it extends to really everything this team can do. Um, in the middle of that defensive line, though, we already said that we caught wind through photos that uh, Coulter Woodmansey, w- Curtis Woodmansey, um, mm-hmm. was back. Uh, but so is Joshua Campbell playing next to him in the middle. That's going to be huge. Um, the only other name that I did see who is back on here that I think we were a little uncertain is one Kane Stevenson. Mm-hmm. Um, again, adding to that repertoire of offensive weapons that I think makes us so excited for this offense. Um, <laughs> Scott's gone. Campbell's back. Stevenson's back. Maybe a couple other names that haven't jumped out, but I feel like those are three names worth starting off with as far as this Guelph Griffin team, right? Absolutely. And while yes, not having a Scott uh, Murray is is a big detriment to uh, to the team here. They were able to to do a lot of things last year without him there as well. So it's not something that it's going to be really as apparent this year as, as opposed to last year. But getting Campbell back and getting Kane Stevenson back is massive for this club. A, we already know Josh Campbell is really great at what he does. Him and Wood Manzi as the uh, one and three tech for that uh, defensive line is outstanding. But my goodness, everybody who's been watching Guelph Griffins knows Kane Stevenson and knows the capabilities that he has. It was even more so put on display for me personally when I was at that East West or sorry, the CFL combine that he was there at everybody was looking around being like, he went into the, the running back one-on-ones and was dominant against some very good linebackers and then went into the pass Skelly and was putting people in a, as a turnstile. Like he was outstanding in his route running and his blocking. He was a little bit bigger than some of the linebackers, but a little bit faster than some of the smaller DBs having him back for Tristan, the and for Marshall McCray is massive for this Griffin team. Absolutely. 
Now, I think, again, week one's always a fun week to talk about because we can see some of the roster changes. We can think about guys that might not be there in the case of teams where we don't have those full rosters yet. But other than that, we're going into this blind as far as what these teams will look like this season. As much as we can mm-hmm. think about roster moves, players elevating just through the natural growth that we hope and they certainly hope and their teams do too, are all taking, getting a year older, a year wisened, an extra year in the weight room. But as well, we can look at how these teams fared last year. And I think we'll have to kind of lean on that to give us a bit of a sense from the jump, um, which again was a week nine matchup in Guelph, or pardon me, in Ottawa with major playoff stakes on the line, Mm -hmm. a game that Carlton comes back from, let's set the stage here, fourth quarter, Guelph's up 20 to 13 going into the fourth quarter. Carlton scores a rouge, but then Marshall McRae runs in a touchdown. They go up 27 to 14 with two minutes and 14 seconds left in this game. Guelph goes up 27 to 14 with two minutes, 14 seconds left. Carlton able to get a touchdown Lefebvre to Hunter Brown, 27-21. And I'm, I didn't go through the game tape, but I forget exactly how the turnaround happened. I feel like there was a Guelph turnover in the mix there. But with 12 seconds left in the game, Frederick Hatchie gets a 50-yard bomb from Lefebvre as well leading to not only Carlton picking up the win at home, leading to Carlton putting up a very, very impressive performance despite the loss in the first round of the playoffs at Windsor and Guelph missing the playoffs. Um, We see that as the last outing between these two clubs. We don't get the update on the Carlton roster uh, aside from a few things like you pointing out on is back. And we see some of the changes for, for Guelph. Both these teams are in the CRT the the, uh, the tier C for us. What are some of the things you look at with these two teams based on what we saw last year, where their strengths are and possible areas where one another can really attack the other? Well, I think it's really important to look at, this is the last game for Guelph and it's the last win that Carlton had. So it's definitely a resounding game for both of these squads. Obviously Carlton uh, losing in the first round of the playoffs, uh, but still, a for Carlton, when you look at this here, like you detailed, there's less than two minutes left and they're down by two scores. And for them, for Carlton to not even blink, but to have, lean on Tristan Lefebvre and lean on that passing game and to, to score two touchdowns plus a rouge in quick succession is outstanding to see not only as you know competitors, but for a team's mentality. We talked about that previously about how important it is to be in those close games and to be able to come out of those because now you've got calmness. When it's the fourth quarter and you're down by a couple of scores and you've got five or six minutes left, for teams who haven't been in that same scenario, there's a there's a fear. There's a panic that starts to rise about, oh my God, we got to score. We got to score now. And then that leads to quarterbacks trying to force it a little bit. That leads to running backs trying to you know dive to get a, a few extra yards and then a fumble happens or a pick happens or whatever. And that's really where the team can really seem to unravel. When you have that history of, you know what? We've been in these tight games and we've actually come out on the other side of it. We just need to keep ourselves, keep to our game plan and go forward. That's a massive deal to have. And I think that Carlton team is going to keep that going into this year. For this Guelph squad, that's a heartbreaking way to lose at the end of the season for sure. But you also have to remember, these guys were battered from the entire year. I think they were on the third stringers in certain cases because so many guys had gone down, especially on that defense. So I think this was a battered Guelph team making the trip up to, uh, to Ottawa to try and get back into the playoffs here. And I just don't think that they were in the right mindset for something like this, obviously losing the manner that you do doesn't help at all, but it was very indicative of the Guelph team and what they had gone through the, that entirety of last year. Definitely. And again, I think for, for Carlton, it, it led to some really positive mojo going into the off season. And in addition to all the other things they did that year and I, I, what we've admired that coach Grant has been building there was a really positive step. And for Guelph, the injuries are absolutely, uh, to- are absolutely fair to, to look at. And as you said, this has been a theme for us in talking about Guelph over the last couple of years, but as well, uh, you know, you, you end up missing the playoffs with that loss. It, it may not have mattered in the long run because 
you know, Guelph ends the season on a three game losing streak, which included a loss to Waterloo. So if they ended up in a tie break situation with Waterloo, they may still have missed the playoffs, but you lose at Waterloo, you lose at home to Queens, you lose on the road, as we highlighted in some detail against Carlton. And I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of time between that last game of the regular season and the start of this season, but I think I would be more bullish on trying to make a connection of like, man, to start, to end a season like that, the same way when you end a half of football mm-hmm. on a bit of a, a bad note, it can affect the way you start the second half. Again, it's a long time between the lot between week nine and 2023 and week one of 24. But I think another reason I don't really care all that much about it is because I think with making coach Saria, the head coach, bringing in some new faces to the coaching staff or some old faces in new places or in whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it it kind of just like all that stink, all the, those things that you can say of like, man, that's not how you end a season. I think you can kind of just wipe your hands of it and say like, let's just focus on who we are now and what we have to, to offer to the league. So from that standpoint, let's get into this matchup. And I think mm-hmm. on the one hand, um, though we're very excited to see number one how Guelph handles again having Tristan Abood and Marshall McRae back. Obviously, last year Abood was the predominant uh, QB one in the mix, and we, we've looked at some of those receivers that both of them have at their disposal to be able to uh, get the ball out to. And obviously, confirming that Kane Stevenson is back is is huge. But this is a situation where I think when I look at this matchup without having anything other than what we've seen in the past couple of years and, and maybe how they're looking now is, you know, we talked about how Guelph was susceptible in the run game um, last year and kind of for two years now, Carlton's been a team that other teams have had success running the ball on as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And if there's, you know, one theme that we've been so excited again, maybe this passing attack for Guelph will really, you know, take off, um, under Saria and with these weapons back, uh, Abood and, and McRae, is guys like Spencer Masterson, Daniel uh, Hosevar, uh, Mitchell Sheshinger returning on that O-line with Coach McDonald returning to coach them up. And of course, as much as any returning player affects a, a, a positional group or whatever, you have Isaiah Smith returning alongside Donovan Malloy in that backfield. To me, that's the first thing that jumps out about this. Obviously, we'll talk about Carlton's passing attack because they were obviously one of the best we saw last year Mm -hmm. and how we think this Guelph defense and their secondary can hold up against it. But I am most intrigued to see, you know, we kind of called our shot that Guelph could very well be the best running attack in Ontario and and even on the U Sports stage and how effective Carlton's defense can hold up against that. I mean, absolutely. When you look at Carlton, especially on that D-line, you think, hey, there's a light body there that ain't so light anymore. And I'm not (laughs) sure if light body is back or not. Like we said, Carlton hasn't updated their rosters and all that. But um, there's always been that stalwart defensive line. And obviously on Yekka being back is massive and whatever. But once you get past that, and especially with Guelph's O-line, they there's one thing that's universal with all of Coach McDonald's offensive line is that they can move. And when you can move, you can hit, obviously you can hit that first level of D-lineman, but you can get up to linebackers pretty quick as well. And that's something that is coached very, very often with Coach McDonald's O-line. If they can get to that secondary so that either Donovan Malloy or Isaiah Smith is not making contact with anybody until they're in the secondary, man, you're looking at 15, 20 yard gains every time because they've got the power and the speed to run over guys or run away from them. So that's a very dangerous combination right there. Um, I'm just really excited just as a general statement, we'll get into the offense and defense for on the opposite side, but a fully healthy Guelph Griffin team to get onto the field. Let's see what that chemistry looks like. Let's see how they can mesh. You know, we've, we've been focusing a lot on, you know, obviously the Tristan Abood and Marshall McRae. How does Isaiah Smith and Donovan Malloy kind of mesh now? Because certainly going into last year, Isaiah Smith would have been their, their primary running back. And Donovan Malloy comes out and goes, hey, you know what? I can run the damn ball too. How do they get that mesh going? How do they split reps? How does that whole interaction kind of take place i'm really interested to see that but i'm i if i'm looking at that golf griffin run game to really see some big things and then oh by the way you stack the box i got kane stevenson on one side i got vishon janus on the other side i think we're going to be okay in the passing game too 
Definitely. And, and, you know, I'm just going to take this opportunity. I can't wait to talk about him more throughout the season, but a shout out as we talk about a little Guelph run game, uh, a young man named Ke- uh, Kanye Nethersall hailing from London South, a guy I got to coach up a little bit, joining that backfield as well. He's in his first year. I don't know what kind of impact he will have, but that was just a beautiful moment for me getting to see him on the roster, uh, not just any OU roster, but the team, of course, uh, I played for for five seasons. Now, I think, again, we can talk all day about how electric this passing offense can be and how much, you know, that O-line, we talked about the effect in the run game, but as well being able to obviously support the passing game and things like that. But you highlighted his name. I mean, Michael Lightbaugh in the, in the middle, really solid veteran presence, but it's it's on Yeka on the edge. And I'm, you know, kind of curious, one former offensive lineman, one offensive line coach to another. It, what is your philosophy ultimately then to say, okay, look, Onyeka is a, a, a game breaker, you know, not just his ability to get off the quarterback, but obviously in how he can, uh, you know, mess up the things you want to do in your run game as well. You mentioned the piece on Guelph under Coach McDonald, really emphasizing let's be fast, let's work our doubles, get to the second level that, you know, allow our running backs to really get those, those big, those big breaking uh, runs in your estimations. Is that then a product of saying, okay, where's on Yeka? We're going the other way. Cause he's the, he's a beast and we got to We don't want to go near him. Or do you take the philosophy of where's on Yeka? We're going right at him. Cause this is a four quarter battle. We are playing. And if we attack him on the ground game, not only will that tire him out in a, and positively impact our rushing attack. But then you know what? When Abood or McCray is dropping back and looking to find Genesis or Stevenson or Ogilvy or any of these guys, we know that they're now that Onyek is now a little more tired than he otherwise would be. I think no matter what, you have to account for him. I mean, the amount of times that we saw, hey, obviously we know that he's a force in the pass rush game. We know that he's coming after quarterbacks no matter what. But the amount of times that we saw, hey, we're going to do like a stretch play away from Onyeka and he's on block and he chases it down anyways because he's got a motor, one of the best motors that I've seen in the OUA, you have to account for him. Even if you're going to do like a zone away, you better be bombering the backside so that somebody's hitting him because otherwise he's chasing down those running backs. Even with as, as good as Donovan Malloy and Isaiah Smith are, if they're making a hesitation or they need to stop or anything, you've got Onyeka laying the boom there. So you have to account for him. In my personal uh, standing, I'm running d- directly towards him. I'm going at uh, Ivy Onyeka just to make sure that if he is going to make somebody miss that I'm accounting for it, you know, if you're doing a stretch play towards him, he slips inside, you go outside. If he goes outside, you cut up, you make it so that wherever, whichever way he commits to that you're accounting for it and you can build off of that. Because if you just leave him, you're like, yeah, we're going to toss away from him. We'll be fine. Mm -mm, He's coming after you and he's going to chase that thing down. So regardless, however you decide to run the ball, even if you're tossing the other way, have some kind of fake crack mo- motion or some something to just make him hesitate a little bit because he's fast enough and he's got the motor to chase you down. Definitely. And and again, well, like, I'm really excited to see how this Guelph team uses all these weapons. I think that's where, you know, despite, I think I may, I said on the Guelph pod, this tier C pod that I Guelph, I'd be disappointed unless everyone gets injured of them not making the playoffs. But otherwise, like I think you have to give Coach Saria a bit of cushion from the head coaching standpoint, from an offensive coordinator standpoint, yeah, there's still a transition that's involved in that piece of things, but he's been with this program. And if everyone, if people are healthy, he's got so many tools that I think, again, there is a bit of pressure to say, look, like, you know, like this is an offense that should be one of the best, has the potential to be one of the best. Mm-hmm. Now, l- let's flip the table a little bit. We talked about uh, for Guelph, and I, you know, I don't want to make this Guelph centric. I think we got to talk about this Carlton passing attack. Obviously, we haven't even talked about you know uh, Tristan Lefebvre and as a top three quarterback, arguably in Ontario. But I, just quickly to set the table for that, because obviously to talk about Carlton's offense, we're going to juxtapose that with Guelph's defense. Uh, we obviously mentioned Scott Murray being uh, gone. Um, it, it eluded my my uh, first glance over not seeing Yusuf Al Khalidi either. Um, which is a loss and that could be effective, especially in the run game um, for them. Um, But as well, you know, I I don't think we were really too mystified about whether he was going to be back in terms of eligibility and things like that, but seeing Anthony Mortuzo's name on the, 
on the roster for Guelph is, is obviously a major boon for, for what they can do. Um, let's talk about that, but let's talk about what this Carlton passing attack again, uh, without seeing much else other than our assumption that Josh Ferguson is, is, uh, it may be still <laughs> around the program, but he's probably not taking carries. They got Alex Gale in the backfield and they got, you know, Kasim Ferdinand out there, all Canadian, uh, level receiver along with your, your Hatchie, uh, your Hatchies, your Browns, your ready, all these guys that makes that Carlton offense so tough to prepare for. What do you see in terms of that side of this matchup? Well, listen, I mean, you look at last year, Carlton is the number three passing offense in the entire OUA, and the only other two offenses above him are Evan Hillock and the Western Mustangs and Taylor Ogersma and the Laurier Golden Hawks. That's phenomenal uh, company to be a part of. And even with our guy in Josh Ferguson and Alex Gale, they only they didn't really run the ball all that effectively. Like I said, they were one, only one of three teams that didn't uh, go over that thousand yard mark on the running game for the year, at least in the regular season. So I think you continue if you're Carlton, you continue to lean on the things that you do really well. I mean, Tristan Lefebvre has, uh, has solidified himself as a real serious quarterback threat in the OUA. You know, we had him in the top five of, of quarterbacks, and I made the the call out um, earlier to one uh, Alex Vreekin to say, hey, be that third uh, elite quarterback in the OUA. I think Tristan Lefebvre has the complete capabilities to do the same thing, quite honestly. I love his arm. I love the, uh, the decision-making that he's been doing. The athletes that he's got to throw to are nothing to sneeze at either, especially with having a guy like Kasim Ferdinand and those guys. So I think you come out of here, and if you're Carlton, yes, it's week one. Yes, you're trying to establish a bunch of things. But recognize that, hey, you know, we the, we're the number three passing offense as of last year. We can throw the, the ball pretty damn well. And let's not forget, yes, Guelph really struggled in the run game. The pass off uh, the pass game last year wasn't anything to sneeze at either. Obviously, we harken back to that Loria game with Taylor Elgisma doing his thing. Yeah. But still, yeah, yeah. I think that there's a lot of opportunities here for this Carlton offense to really do their thing as well. Now, obviously, once you start really um, pass, once you get into a pass heavy standpoint here, that allows that Griffin defense to pin their ears back and come after you with a healthy Brandon Farago and Anthony Martuzzo back that I think that it's going to be a different game plan. Like I said, it might be in some cases, especially in some position groups, a brand new team from what Carlton played against Guelph in the last game of the season here, just because of all of those injuries. So I don't think that it's going to be the exact same thing. I don't think that Carlton's going to be able to move the ball and score 14 points in the final two minutes like they did in the la that last game. However, this is a very good Carlton offense. And I going into this, the idea isn't like, hey, we're going to stop them on every, on every down. It's we need to limit what they're really doing here. Lefebvre's going to find his guys. They're going to do some good things, but let's limit them and have a real bend but don't break kind of mindset so that we're stopping them in the key moments, even if they're driving down the field. Definitely. And yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned that that Laurier game. I think that's totally fair. And as well, even with Mortuzo back, we're seeing now this defense songs Devin Cromwell, mm -hmm. right? And, and how how are other guys going to pick up the pieces without him? You know, guys like Anakin Guthrie, um, Malcolm Campbell, um, and some of those guys in the secondary. Um, this is, I mean, and, and again, we mentioned on one of the preview pods, Tom, you and I are going to be there uh, live and direct uh, mm -hmm. from Alumni Stadium. Um I say we shall we make some picks? Shall we get it going? Let's do it. Let's do it. Beautiful, Tom. I give you the floor. Carlton at Guelph to open up the season. Who are you taking? Listen, without all of the, the pieces that we kind of detailed here, I really would not be surprised if obviously every time we go into a first week of the season, it's very common for the offense to be a little bit further behind than where the defenses are. It's easier to get a defense up up and running than it is for an offense. That's just as a typical kind of set setting. But I think both of these offenses have a lot of explosive playmakers that if they can get the ball in their in their hands, it doesn't have to be these big chunk plays, but you get a guy like a Kasim Ferdinand, Hunter Brown, or a Kane Stevenson, Isaiah Smith, you get them the ball with some room in front of them, and they're going to make th some things work. I think this is going to be, it has the potential to be a high scoring affair. However, a healthy Griffin squad, I'm going with Guelph. I'm, I think they're taking the win this one home field advantage they've got this over carlton you're darn tootin they do i'm going with my griffins as well and you know what 
I, I feel like, again, going back to the potential of having Isaiah Smith and Donovan Malloy in the same backfield, veteran O linemen on that line, um, and all these things, and how exciting and dynamic this team can be. Do you remember, was it two or three years ago? I forget. I don't, Lord knows, I don't remember what the game was specifically, but I just remember us texting while watching a Western Mustang game where they're going no huddle, marching down the field. And you know what? <laughs> After they feed Keon a few times, here comes Edward Winati. And then yeah. back and forth behind that O line. And then before you know it as well, there's a bomb to Savon Magne Jones because they've just pulled you so close on that line of scrimmage. Just, just, running back after running back killer after killer and i think again that not that doesn't necessarily have to be the direction that saria goes with the offense and how he uses these weapons but i think that's a really cool possibility <laughs> that i think yeah. again could make guelph's offense um extraordinarily dynamic but yeah i could see it being in the context of a shootout with uh this carlton team again a carlton team that like a few other teams uh at time of recording we still have some question marks about but we're in lockstep going with our Guelph Griffins first game of the OUA season. Let's head to the end of the 401 to talk about our next matchup, the battle of tier B the <laughs> on the cusp teams in the Queens golden Gales and the Windsor Lancers. Now, before we dive into the details of how we think this one's going to shake down much like with Guelph, a few updates with these two teams mm -hmm. from the time which we recorded the beer tea, the tier B beer tea. I, you know, <laughs> two of my favorite beverages, but they got nothing to do with what we're talking about. The tier B podcast. We have the confirmed rosters for Queens and for Windsor, both with massive, massive updates. Tom, uh, I, it hurts me too much to say these names who are no longer with these clubs. I think you're a stronger individual than I share the news <laughs> with folks who may not have seen these updates. So on the Queens golden Gales on the offensive side of the ball, we had talked about, Hey, there's some potential for certain guys to come back. And we gave our best uh, thought process here, but there's no Evan Florin and there's no Ryan Berta on that offensive line. And even more surprising than that, there is no Anthony souls back for the queens gales that offense that's that's those are three massive names to what that offensive running game was as of last year obviously kasari being that real bell cow that's a that's he's still he's confirmed to being back and things but not having the two pillars of that offensive line with him again is big now and now tom for everyone listening in right now they might be saying well hey you know what then it's Windsor all the way because sure you still got Kasari, but Windsor has a D line that can give any team on their best day fits, even with returning CFL O lineman and even with a second string running back who's a first string running back on most teams. <laughs> so this is trouble for Queens, right? Because Windsor's just gonna gobble up that run game altogether. And they they very well white. They very well might. But their Windsor is going to have to do it without their star defensive tackle. There is no Mufta Ageli. Mufta, heck out of the way, has left the program, has left the building. You will not see him suiting up for the Windsor Lancers this year. I, I, it, Zach is legitimately heartbroken. This stinks, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Mufta... Like, oh man, what a what a pleasure it was watching him do his thing for Windsor. Uh, I, I I don't know where he's landed football wise, and if football is in the cards for him, something he wants to pursue, then you know what? It wouldn't surprise me if he is coming to a television set near you or I in the near future because he had such a great talent. And again, you think about the impact of him being a Canadian guy, and then what that would mean for a CFL team maybe one day. But, um, man, that stinks. I think, though, ultimately, that hasn't re changed around like where we sort of consider these two uh, clubs a, 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 as as big an impact as as this might have. Because on the other hand, we weren't too certain about Kaladia Moose, and he is back for that Windsor defense, along with a ton of other guys. Um, Tom, this is still obviously the story of two teams that 
You know, we'll see what Vreekin uh, is looking like coming back off of injury. We'll see where Windsor has landed um, between Skelton, the veteran, and, uh, and Nick Domofsky, the young guy who obviously took the reins at the end of the year, and they got some great weapons in their receiving core as well. But at the end of the day, these are two teams who have made an impact on the OUA over the last couple of years, running the ball so well mm -hmm. and playing top-notch defense. Obviously, those names that you highlighted affect those things, but at the end of the day, that still seems to be the identity of these two clubs, and I think what we're anticipating seeing going into this matchup. Most definitely, and when you start looking at, yes, Mufta Geli is gone, and that's a that's a big that's a big front, but Claudia Moosen still back, Devin Verisuk still back, Ethan John still back. Like you've got your still all star defense that is ready and raring to go. So. While having that big body is obviously a massive bonus to this team, it's not like they're just going to drop right off. This was the number one defense in the land for a damn reason. And I really think that Windsor is still going to be a, a massive problem for people to have to deal with on this offense. Now, when you look at it conversely here, we watched last year, and we talked about this in that B tier podcast that we were going through, but Windsor's defense won that game against Queens last year. And they really stepped up to the plate. Danny Skelton had some, a lot of issues going into last year. I think that Queens defense really got to him and really rattled him. But Devin Verisuk with the uh, the pick six there, that defense just constantly getting turnovers and rattling. I believe it was Anthony Leo in that in that setting. Now, Alex Vreekin back and healthy. You've got Matt Nesbitt as his first offensive coordinator with the Queens Golden Gales here. He, you know that he's going to put him into solid scenarios for him to be successful. And oh yeah, like we mentioned, the number one rusher in the OUA last year in Jared Kasari, he's back as well. So you've got a lot of options on this Queens offense. And especially now that you don't have to say, Kasari, you have to win this game for us against the number one uh, defense in the land. Now you can just say, hey, Alex Freakin is back. We've got some uh, playmakers in the uh, in the receiving core. We can make sure that Kasari has some balance there as well when he's running the ball. I think this Queens offense is going to have a whole lot more to say about, hey, you know, you might have beaten us last year, but now the big guns are back. We're all ready and healthy and ready to go. Let's do this thing. Definitely. And I think a player to watch for Queens, again, as you said, it's Nesbitt taking over the reins on the offense, but it would make all the sense in the world, especially that he was the offensive line coach for the last number of years. He still is that the offense maintains a similar identity than the one mm -hmm. it did. After all, this was a change that seemingly was sparked by the fact that Flaxman left, not just being like, you know what? Flaxman stuff isn't working. Let's promote Nesbitt ahead of him. Right. So it makes all the sense in the world. There's a lot of those similarities. So I think in it, you know, I can't believe we haven't yet started doing this ourselves, but if you're out there playing, say, um, OUA U Sport Fantasy Football, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to throw out a name for you as far as a guy that isn't a starter necessarily, but one Jaden Blackman for mm -hmm. uh, Queens running back out of London going into his third year. I say all that being we've seen him uh, be an effective runner at times during his time there. And again, if this offense maintains somewhat of a similar identity, Maybe all of a sudden he becomes that guy getting you seven, eight, nine touchdowns when they hand him the ball to punch it in. Um, though there's a difference of like 50 pounds between him and Jared Kasari. <laughs> so maybe you just keep it in Kasari's hands. And he has a year that even exceeds what we saw from him last year. Um, I guess last thing I'll say, I'll note a, f a few things. Obviously, we talked about George Una um, gra uh, getting drafted into the CFL off that Windsor offensive line that's been so good for them. But seeing a guy like Jackson Morkin return, um, that's really going to help anchor them down. Um, but as well, you know, kind of in the same way that we can talk about, uh, you know, Queen's uh, offense still being effective, having uh, their run game still being so effective, having lost guys on that O-line. Um, even if you lose a guy like uh, George Una, as far as the O-line is concerned, this is a team in Windsor that returns that full stable of offensive weapons, uh, specifically in the backfield. When we look at the three, sometimes four-headed beasts, depending on how you want to frame it, of Joey Zorn, Christopher John, 
Wavy Mambo, and of course Liam Talbot is kind of that scat back, sometimes you know slot receiver getting those jet sweep type looks, along with the the likes of of Javoni Cunningham and other guys that have been in that offense for a bit, like Shane Johnson and Colby uh, Colby Ginn. Um, this is a team that really started to you know wake people up on the back of that run game and the defense, much like we said with Queens. Lose a guy like Una. Got some returning guys all under Coach Beardy, one of the best in the business as far as coaching up O-lines. He's mm. been there. Um, he's worked with this program. Obviously, you know, the Don knows a thing or two about effective <laughs> O-lines. You lose a guy like Una, that's hard to replace. Overall, do you see this run game still being the thing that this team leans on? I think based off of everything that we saw from last year, I still do. I think you're still... From the outside looking in, at least, maybe they've made some decisions. Maybe they've seen some real improvement. But from the outside looking in, there's a lot of questions around your quarterback. There's a questions around Danny Skelton in terms of he had a outstanding start to the season and really showcased what he was able to do, but really fell off against some of the top tier quality defenses, starting with that Queens game as of last year. So maybe there's some question marks there. Maybe there's, hey, do we go with Skelton? Do we go with Domofsky? How is this... Um, what's the chemistry like between these guys and their receivers. And then you look back and you say, Oh yeah, we've got Joey Zorn, Wavy Mambo and Christopher John. Let's lean on these dudes. Let's make sure that we establish the run game to make our passer a whole lot more comfortable because as we've always talked about, and as is true with all of football, if you can win on first down and make that second and long turn into a second and four, suddenly that passing route, those options that you have get a whole lot easier, but Easier said than done when you talk about a couple of missing pieces on that. Well, not missing pieces, but a couple of guys that have gone on to bigger and better things in George Una, Van Wisher, Darian Newell, Silas Hubert, all back for the Queens Golden Gales, all ready to really reestablish themselves as the top tier defensive line in the OUA. So you talk about a first round test for this Windsor O-line. You can't get much better than those three guys. Plus the list of other outstanding Queens golden Gale defenders that are going to be out there testing them and really making sure that they know, Hey, listen, you might've cooked our goose last game, but we're still Queens. We're still fighting for Yates cups. You got to go through us. If you really want to get to where you want to go. And, and that I think helps transition into the final stage of our commentary for all these games which is of course picking a winner which you know we I think talked about it on the preview pod and uh, you know we, we we likened this game to Queens hosting Laurier week one last year where this is a game that we're going to be looking back on at the end of the year and and, and you know we, we, the the season will play out how it plays out and it doesn't ever come down to just one game in the grand scheme of an eight game season so to speak um, but that this is you know, a playoff game from the standpoint of when it's all said and done, you know, we have you in that top echelon with Western and Laurier, even if we put them a tick above um, and with some frisky teams like Carlton and Guelph um, that we just talked about nipping at your heels. Queens must be furious two years in a row, having to go to Windsor. Um, and, you know, despite all, all we've talked about with both these clubs, I, that's a great point you bring up with the D-line and how that's going to test this O-line. Um, I'll start us off with the picks and, and say that under those golden arches, you know, hey, I like those golden gales, but, I, you know, I like those golden arches a, a little bit more when it comes to how it sways games. I think this is going to be another beat them up. It's kind of be, this is going to be the opposite of Carlton versus Guelph. It's yeah. going to be a beat them up <laughs> defensive game. Maybe Queens goes to the recipe they did with Vrieken against Western and say, we'll throw the ball 45 times. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a good secondary that Windsor has as well. I see this as a low scoring affair. I see Windsor eking it out at home against the Golden Gales. We, lo we looked at Queens and they had a very, very tough beginning of their season last year as well home hosting the Laurier Golden Hawks and we saw an Alex Vreekin and a, a Queens offense that should be poisoned ready to go really struggle against another top tier defense in Laurier especially with having guys like an Ethan Gagorsic who was in his first year first ever live bullets obviously that, that score was a difference of one point but they ended up losing that one and didn't see the same offensive capabilities that this team could really have that was at home 
to then transition that to we're going to travel all the way down to Windsor and you're going to play against last year's number one defense in the country. I think this is a tall task. I think you see a lot of good things from both squads, but like you said, it is damn tough to win at the end of the 401. Windsor starts the campaign 1-0 and and they look strong doing it. Whichever way it it breaks out, again, the only thing that would truly surprise me is anything but a great game between these two clubs. Well, going from two games that are really hard to pick, let's go to one that's a little easier. The nightcap for the Saturday opening up the OUA weekend where the Laurier Golden Hawks travel to the other side of Highway 6 to take on your McMaster Marauders. Uh, a game that you and I will also be in attendance for. So maybe I should pump the brakes on the uh, <laughs> back side of things. But I think if I've earned any hatred from that program, I don't know how much more I could do to to amp that one up. So I guess I just have to ride with it. Um, yeah, we're doing the Guelph thing at 1 o'clock with them versus Carlton going down Highway 6 to see Laurie at Mac. Um Tom, look, this is a, a Laurier team that is out for a vengeance this year. Um, that is certainly aware of some of those things that we've talked about too, in terms of that this like they they need they need to win the Yates Cup this year. They they need to because like that window with some of the players in the years they have, I don't think this is a team that would fall off a cliff by any means. They have some great young players in there, but this is a team that's built to win this year. Mm-hmm. Um and you know, you obviously saw, and I think it'll be informative for our conversation about this game, less so when these teams played each other last year in season, but you seeing them do battle in spring camp. Um, on the other hand, of course, this is a Mac team that, you know, uh, with Keegan Hall, some of those receivers he has, that if they're really doing their thing with, um, you know, uh, a defense that really is up there with the best defenses in this league, that, I guess I'm spoiling my pick. I don't think folks would look to upset Laurier in week Mm -hmm. one, but you know, I guess what are those things that we'd look to see from this club to say that, Oh, you know what? Mac has turned a a new leaf. Cause I don't think that has to come in the form of a win Uh, spring camp game that you were in attendance for. And really what is it that we're looking for these two clubs being in, in markedly different positions in their, in their growth and where they're at. I think when you look at this, I think the most exciting matchup that you can really see is going to be that Laurier offense against the McMaster defense. Um, certainly there's there's <laughs> there's a lot more to be talking about here, but you see the return of Taylor Elgersmo to the field. You see the entire Laurier offense that is back and ready to go with Tanner Nelms, Quentin Scott, his receiving core, O-line. Everybody is back and ready to go here. And like you said, They've got a chip on their damn shoulder. They haven't been able to to conquer the Western Mustangs here. Everybody is coming back from Laurier to make sure that they're completing a mission that all of them set out to get to, which is Yates Cups and Vanier Cups. And you got to take it one step at a time. However, looking on the opposite side of things, we know that that McMaster offense last year really struggled. But the reason why in our C-tier pod, I made the case that last year they really conceivably could have been seven and one because of those tight games was because of that defense led by Scott Brady and all of those guys out there. I I'm really interested to see what he brings to the table here, how he tries to make Taylor a little uncomfortable getting, getting into, you know, some blitz packages, trying to pressure him, trying to get after him so that he's making tough throws. I'm interested to see how this McMaster defense can really try to go after these guys. I think this is a very balanced Laurier attack. And I think that while you're going to be as focused as possible on Taylor Elgersma, you're going to see a guy like Tanner Nelms uh, and Quentin Scott really be able to take off on the ground and make sure that you stay honest and that you can't just pin your ears back. So I'm really interested to see what that matchup looks like more than anything, because I think that's going to be a bit of a dogfight, at least in the beginning. Yeah, a lot of great things you, you, you raised there that kind of bring a number of thoughts to mind. You know, of course, that whole idea of being in that 50-50 club. Um, you're totally right. This was a team that was in a lot of games, um, largely on the back of that defense. I think we can go back to thinking about week one with them hosting Windsor, a game that, you know, you're sitting there pulling your hair out along with some of your McMaster uh, alumni. Um, when in reality, at the end of the day, I think, Obviously, Windsor was the better club. So Mm -hmm. almost with hindsight being what it is, we can reframe that game of being like, you know what? 
frustrating game for Mac. It really did show where they were weak. That seemed to be consistent throughout the year. But you know what? You you hung in close with one of the best teams in, in the province and one of the best defenses in all of Canada. On the flip side, a team in Laurier where it, it took them a couple weeks to offensively really get the lead out. And, you know, we talked about that with Queens a little bit uh, just in their game with Windsor in setting up their game with Windsor. Is that going to be something with Laurier that maybe, again, do we see a bit of that easing into the season or it's like, hey, we're returning our guys. We don't need to ease into nothing like everything. We talked about this with some of the new defensive coordinators and spots in the OUA. The playbook's open, like added wrinkles and things like that. But overall, we're doing what we are uh, doing. Um the last thing I want to add, I'll add in there just quickly as well is thinking about obviously talk about the return of these uh, Golden Hawk offensive players. Brew Baker, Anya Menem, no longer there. Yeah, we talk about the addition of Dolly Wall and the return of some other great players on that defense uh, and sending them on the D line. That could be something that's interesting where now all of a sudden, if especially Brew Baker, who was an absolute nightmare for O-lines and quarterbacks last year on men and them just an overall immaculate defensive player if this is an improved offensive line for Mac is is Hall getting a couple opportunities to hit his guys like cooling and and if Priestner's back and some of these other guys to again maybe be a situation where if Laurier is again a little bit slow to start the season which is always fair for for any team Mm -hmm. um that if we think about last year Mac opening up at home against one of the top teams in the OUA. That could this be a game where, again, they're still in that fifty-fifty category, and you know you're putting up a, a a better performance against really the only team you played last year that you didn't have a good outing against. You say that best case seven and one. That one in the loss column that never changed in our estimations was when you played Laurier. That's certainly a sign of growth if you can show, hey, you know what, we might not be beating this team, but maybe we're in. Maybe it doesn't quite get to a 50-50 game with Laurier. But, like, this is a good test to show, hey, you were in those 50-50 games with all the other teams you played. This is the team that clearly dogged you from the start to the end of that game. For sure. And that's that was a Laurier team that had hit their stride when it comes to offensively and defensively last year against McMaster. For sure, there's going to be some stuff that's still work around, still shaking the rust off and some of those shoulder pads and really getting into things with your first action and live bullets here. But once again, the chemistry, I think, is already there. I think they've already had that going. And in particular, you mentioned I was at that spring game. In that spring game, while you saw great athletes kind of going at it, you also saw, I think I saw six or seven, you know, fights or scuffles or at least guys that had to be broken up a few times. And I think... A, that showcases McMaster is hungry, and I think they want to prove themselves and they got something to prove. But B, I saw a Taylor Elgersma at the end of the game really uh, looking a little upset, looking a little fired up and ready to go. And as you and I know, after speaking with Taylor Elgersma last year, uh, there was a, some preamble right before the Guelph game that got Taylor a little fired up as well, and we saw the result of that. So I think that both of these squads are going to be going all out uh, right at week one of the season here. I think Drake Bodie and that defense is really going to have to step up to make sure that they're putting their offense in a proper place. And Keegan Hall for this McMaster offense, it's going to be the same thing for the entire year. Finish. You've had a lot of success. Yeah. You've been able to get into certain areas. You've been ga- getting into the red zone and just outside of that. How many times have you had to come out with a field goal? I mean, there's a reason why Michael Horvat was a second team all Canadian because of how many kicking opportunities the guy had. And he's also really good at what he does. Don't get me wrong. But still, you need to finish. There is no scenario here where you get to where you want to go, where that's Yates Cups or beyond, where you do not put up seven instead of threes or settle for rouges. You have to finish this game if you want any hope of staying with Laurier Golden Hawks. Definitely. Um, I guess last thing I'll add in as well, uh, we don't have the updated Mac roster, and I think that leaves the most intrigue as far as defensively um, you mentioned that guy like Drake Bodie, but as well, we had question marks when we were talking about this team in the DRT pod about guys like, you know, again, I'm pretty sure Ryan leader is gone. Um, but some of the, the veteran guys on that defense over the years, like your Nana Yasser Bay, um, Josh Cumber, Devonte Ballantine, uh, like the, the obvious impact of those guys are gone. 
What'll also be interesting, of course, as we talked about with Queens is another example of an O-line coach taking over the offense, how that manifests into the identity of this team. The major difference, well, one of the major differences between this situation and with Queens is that even if you think, oh, O-line coach taking over the offense, maybe they're going to change their identity to a run game. Queens, even losing those guys on the O-line, still has the infrastructure as far as the, the the players on the roster and what they've hung their hat on to say, yeah, that's what we've been. Also, we have a great quarterback. For Mac, it's a bit of a different question, but nonetheless, so interested to see how that shakes out uh, on the season and from day one, what this Mac team looks to establish um, for that offense. Uh, Tom, I obviously gave away my pick. <laughs> um, I don't think you're going to stray from that, but Hey, you're the one with a Mac helmet and, uh, you know, <laughs> the silver and maroon pillows behind you. Maybe you're going to surprise me. Who are you taking here? No, it's, it's the Laurier golden Hawks in this one. That's, that's for sure. However, I am expecting to see a good showcase from this McMaster team. And while you do start off as 0 and 1. I think there's a lot of things to build off of to to get them into a space where they want to go. For Laurier, this is first step in a road to taking care of business for the remainder of the season here. I think they come out, they have a strong showcase, they get a win, and they continue to build to get back against those Western Ponies and hopefully another Yates Cup appearance. Well, you mentioned those Western ponies. That'll transition us into day two of the opening weekend, August 25th, where the reigning Yates Cup champion Western Mustangs are heading to the national capital to take on my Ottawa GGs. A few updates we have to disclose about this one, having gotten, in the case of Ottawa, a roster update. <laughs> and in the case of Western, a photo that came across our 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 respective news feeds that just absolutely blew our mind both on the offensive side of the ball for Ottawa. It was seeing or not seeing that is who Nicholas Gendron mm -hmm. on that offense. Um, CFL.ca didn't really illuminate anything to just make sense of what he's doing um, with his football life and life in general, nor did a social media dive uh that's that's a huge loss they still have some weapons though otherwise that team's looking pretty much as we suspected but in the case of the western mustangs it was as i alluded to a photo of uh, evan hillock uh, maybe you've heard of him taking reps with a certain running back wearing a practice jersey with the number five on it who happened to look a heck of a lot like keon edwards um the re the return apparently of Keon Edwards, which I, like I I say I I, I feel like I, I my tone was weird on that one. I'm excited for that. Like that's great. I love Keon. He's been a, just an absolute stalwart of the OUA for the last seven years, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, and that's fantastic. On the other hand, Gendron not being part of Ottawa and, and how that's going to affect both clubs before we start to compare and contrast this game. Oh, absolutely. When you look at uh, what Nicholas Gendron meant to that offense last year, especially when they had so many injuries at quarterback, when you had Ben Miracle going down and then Ryan Lacanjo, and finally you've got, um, <coughs> excuse me, you've got some consistency there at quarterback near the end of the season. Throughout that entire time, you're throwing the ball up to guys like Max Melafont and you're throwing it to Nicholas Gendron to try to make sure that you're coming down with something to really showcase that this Ottawa GG passing attack was still going to be be very prevalent here. So losing him is a massive blow to that uh, Ottawa offense when they're already having to reel from losing their star running back themselves going into this year. So lots of question marks for this uh, GG offense going into what is a very tough environment traveling from Ottawa to go to London to play against the Yates Cup champions in the Western Mustangs. Sorry. Hey, sorry, it, reversed, yeah. reversed. You're still hosting uh, Western, but you're playing at TD Place, which is kind of turning into your own home field advantage with how often <laughs> you've been playing there uh, for these GGs. But regardless, Western is the one traveling up to Ottawa. My apologies. And they're going to have the 2022 OUA MVP in Keon Edwards back for the Western Mustangs, along with Evan Hillock and all of his 
offensive weapons that he already has to work with to have a guy like Keon Edwards with the caliber of that offense. It just spells a lot of trouble for GGs and GG fans going into this one. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you go back to that matchup last year when these two teams did play in, in London, you know, a, a game where Ottawa's keeping it close early. It opened up with a major, uh, like near 60 yard touchdown for Amlakar Polk and Polk had another touchdown in the third quarter, uh, a game that was, felt kind of early tight it's not uncommon for teams to be in that position with western but can you outlast them because though josh jansen in his first start goes 19 for 24 213 no touchdowns one interception it's evan hillock on the other side 23 for 27 318 and three touchdowns again against a defense that statistically didn't always show it Mm -hmm. um but like when you look across the board at players that they have uh it's it's yeah it's a good defense. Um, so that's obviously troubling uh, when you look at this club. You know, the thing I'll add in as well, we talk about the offense, uh, Polk being gone, um, whether it's Suleiman, uh Kamara taking the bulk of the carries or if it's going to be uh, Charles Asselin taking the bulk of the carries, though he's kind of, as we compared in a bit of that more like Liam Talbot kind of situation where you see them use him a little bit. Our big question ultimately, um, even before knowing Gendron wasn't there, was kind of about how are they going to effectively go about solidifying their quarterback position? And though, of course, you know, they they, they return Miracle, they return uh, Jansen. Um, the one name who is out of that room, though, is is Ryan Lacandro, who you mentioned. Again, like, I wouldn't blame him if he saw the writing on the wall being like, well, shoot, the guy who came in after. <laughs> there was a guy ahead of me he, who got hurt who was coming back, and there was a guy that was below me on the depth chart who came in when I got hurt who looked pretty darn good. Um, <laughs> obviously, that doesn't change who's number one between mm-hmm. um, Jansen and um, Miracle, but again, another name who who isn't there for this club. Um one of the things, though, looking at Ottawa's roster that did obviously, uh, if you're a GG fan, bring a lot of promise um, was getting to actually see number one on the roster, Denny Ferdinand, what we'd heard and, and seen kind of uh, people talk about for a while it is there. It's confirmed. I'm staring at it on the roster. <laughs> um, that's huge. Again, not just from the secondary perspective, but also what he does in the return game. Um Tom, with these two clubs, again, we don't know Western's full roster just yet. We've seen some of these changes on Ottawa, um, but it's pretty well what we expected, aside from Gendron not being there. Before we get into sort of the outcome of who we're picking, and I don't think we'll be too far off. I think we'll be probably in lockstep on this one as well. Just what are the things, perhaps, uh, perhaps more so for Ottawa, knowing what the roster is, but just in a week one matchup, you want to see from these two clubs to just give you a sense of what direction they're trying to go in. Well, we've talked about this a couple of times now with, with Ottawa, both offensively and defensively, (laughs) having star running backs and having to replace them and star linebackers and having to replace them. They did it a couple of years in a row, but now can they do it for a third time? Are they going to have somebody like a Charles Aslan really be able to step up and take care of Polk? Who's going to replace a Max Carboneau? I really don't know what this Ottawa team is going to be and what their um, what their message, what their statement, how how are they going to respond to adversity? What are they really going to what are they going to do? So I'm really interested to see how are you going to respond against as of right now because we're using last year the number one team in the OUA in the Western Mustangs. What are you going to do when Evan Hillock and Keon Edwards and all of those outstanding offensive weapons? What are you going to do when they score a touchdown? Are you going to fold immediately? Are you going to come back and really show that hunger? How are you going to respond to adversity? I'm really interested to see what Ottawa is able to do here. I'm interested to see who's going to be QB one. We've had a lot of conversations around is it Jansen is a miracle. Who's going to be, who's going to come out right and be there. Who's going to be in the backfield for offense and who's going to be that middle linebacker. Who's what's, what's this team going to look like? There are so many question marks that I have about this Ottawa GG's team. And that's honestly a bonus for them going into this week one of the season, because there's only so much game planning that you can do as the Western Mustangs when it comes at least to personnel standpoints here. Now, obviously Western is not exactly known for game planning or 
tailoring what they do to a lot of these other teams. You know they're going to run power offense. You know that they're going to get the balls into their outstanding receivers' hands. You know that that defense is going to play you straight up for the most part at least. So I'm interested to see how does Ottawa affect what Western is trying to do, how do they respond to the adversity here, and who are going to be the bell cows for the GGs this season, offensively and defensively? Yeah, I mean, I think, as you highlight, just number one, as far as who's coming out as QB1, again, if, and I think I think this is leading to a, a consensus Western pick on the road for us, um, not to steal your thunder on that on that point, but again, it's one of those tricky spots where, it, you know, we have these teams in different tiers with a bit of a buffer. And again, Ottawa being in that space where it's step up or step off. So maybe that is all of a sudden a Mac team flip-flopping with them. And all of a sudden it's like a three tier gap, whatever. I say all that in saying that, as we've talked about before, Western's not always, Western can both be a great litmus test as far as, for example, seeing if that front seven Obviously, in the linebacking core, aside from a guy like Daniel Briere, who's been with that program, it's a lot of names I'm not familiar with. Who's going to be the one to step up? Because someone's got to lead that linebacking core. But then as well, being like, okay, Riley Hildebrandt and um, Kevin, uh, da, 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 why am I forgetting his name there? Kevin Anderson. Like, again, let's see if you guys can step up and really start to become a D-line that causes quarterbacks trouble against a really good offensive line uh, for for Western. So on the one hand, we can use that as a litmus test. When you go up against one of the best O-lines, how are you looking? On the other hand, as far as the quarterback issue, this is a defense starring Jackson Finley, uh, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if things go poorly for whomever it is, <laughs> that again, that can be a bit of a misnomer as far as like, who is our guy? What do we want to see with this club? Um, last thing I'll mention is, I think what I'm really interested to see, we, we saw Western... Um, you know, largely from our eyes on the back of that loss against Laval, really trying to move into a pass first offense this past year. No doubt part of that was due to as well, Keon being banged up throughout the year, losing Edward Wanati from the year previously, but also as a way of, you know, kind of showing that, well, for whatever reason, if only just to be able to say like, all right, everyone's sh- 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 quiet. Like we can throw the ball at the best of them. And they did. But with Edwards back, with that O-line, if they're healthy, you know, guys like Berwick O'Neill and obviously our guy Eric Anderson, um, could this be, you know, and guys like Troy Thompson and Yazbek who've been really consistent there as well. I'll be very interested to see, like, what their offense looks to lean on or if, again, they're or maybe they're just going to say, look, we've proven with this iteration of this club we can be the best in the business running it, we can be the best in the business passing it, and, you know, all the tricks are there for us to be able to use. And despite what they did against this Ottawa defense last year, again, I think it's a, a a good litmus test for them to be able to try out some things and show, man, you know what? Like that, you know, that medium passing game was looking really good. Or actually, man, they got this outside zone stretch game going that like, when have we, you know? <laughs> so again, it'll still be interesting for them, even if we are saying they are the favorites of what that offense looks to seemingly put its, stamp its name on. Most definitely. And there's a lot of things that are going into this. uh, And there's a lot of things to kind of really look at here. But I am really, really interested. Because when you look at 2022, obviously, Keon Edwards wins the OUA MVP. And that run game is outstanding. Last year, they lean more on Evan Hillock. And he showcases, hey, I'm not just some average quarterback. I am one of the elites in the OUA here. I'm going to kind of really do my thing. If you can meld both of those into a nice little synergy here where you've got a solid run game backed up with a solid passing game, even more so than what you saw last year, shockingly, I think that this Western offense has the ability to get even better than what they were last year and showcase that they're number one in the OUA for a damn reason. And I know that last year we we kind of kept poking, hey, I think there's some cracks in the armor here. I think there's some opportunities here, whatever. And Western shut the damn door on our faces pretty easily, at least in the OUA. I think Western comes out here and really flexes their muscles and goes, we're still the Mustangs. We're still the team to beat. We're traveling to Ottawa to get the dub and start 1-0. Well, that makes it four for four for us in terms of our picks because, yeah, I'm also taking Western on the road in this ball game. Though, again, of course, I think Ottawa's still a team that, you know, you, you can throw this game out when you get three, four weeks into the season um, as far as what their potential is on the year to still be one of those teams in the middle of the pack, not trying to get caught by some of those teams on their heels. Speaking of some of those teams 
on their heels. That brings us to our last matchup for week one, which is when the U of T Blues under the guidance of their new head coach, Coach Adams, travel to his old digs in Waterloo to take on Chris Bertoya and his Waterloo Warriors, much like the Carlton Guelph game, Tom, a rematch from week nine last year, which again saw a comeback late in the game lead to, in this case, a Waterloo victory on the road, whereas, of course, for Carlton, it was at home. And again, a game that very well might have messed with the playoff seeding when it was all said and done. Um, Obviously, this is the return of Coach D.A. This is the beginning of the Tommy Kanichis era coaching up that offense under what seems to be Scott Barnett, the UFT and Waterloo rosters are updated. Um, and though there are no real surprises, it seems from what we talked about previously, um, it is obviously it, it's somewhat informative to see that, you know, Kinsel Phillips still on this roster with a DB uh, by the position, which obviously like he, he posted about that himself. This isn't too much of a surprise though. It is kind of just like seeing it, with our own eyes with what I will say as well, a, a beautiful top the U of T football club are wearing in their headshots there. I like what they got going there. Some kind of mm-hmm. off white baby blue number there <laughs> looking sharp in the photos is effective photography off the field. Going to translate to effective football on the field. Well, that's where we're looking at with this club U of T on the road against Waterloo. Tom, what are the things you're looking for in this game? Oh, I love how you're able to paint these pictures and just get us into this. You're the best in the biz, my man. Now, when you really look at these squads, I'm really interested to see there's a lot of similarities, in my opinion, between some of these squads and kind of where where they're coming from here. Obviously, DA, first time being a head coach, taking over the U of T Blues, coming back to his uh, where he spent a lot, a lot of time with the Waterloo Warriors. He's going to have a certain edge there because – I know all the stuff that you guys are running, especially on an offensive standpoint here. He was there when Brandon Conway's kind of coming up and being able to lean on coach Chris Bertoya on uh, some of the offensive plays and now becoming his own thing. He was there last year, obviously really seeing what this offense could really do. And especially that run game with those two headed backs for Waterloo here. So he's, he has all of that privy knowledge and he's going to have that little bit of an edge there. However, when you look at these squads and especially when you look at what happened last year, through U of T's offense certainly did struggle at a lot of points last year. I would say that their passing offense was a little, was more effective than their running offense, especially when Scott Barnett really got in there, was able to settle in, settle down and kind of do his thing. I, I foresee that being the same thing going into this year, just as a general rule. I think that passing offense is going to be a little bit more effective than the run game just as a whole. And when you have a style that's like that, the we already talked about offenses take a little bit longer than defenses to really get things going that's especially true for the passing game and when you look at waterloo yes they've got a lot of question marks on that passing game themselves is it going to be nick or is it going to be nolan caban who's going to be a quarterback for them going into this one you damn know that that run game is going to be really really prominent in their game plans throughout the entirety of this season with anthony miller um and quentin springer so I'm really interested to see how they kind of come out of here. I think that the natural progression and just in terms of if all things are equal, how typically teams come through that Waterloo offense is going to see a little bit more production right off the bat than the, the Toronto offense is. But you look at the Toronto defense and Ryan Stewart and what they were able to do last year against some of those teams, especially against, you know, my McMaster Marauders. We've brought that up a few times now, but they certainly have the capabilities to get a lot of turnovers and to score off of those turnovers. So are they going to be able to capitalize on some Waterloo mistakes that Toronto uh, is going to force and really try to turn the tide in their favor? Yeah, I I agree with, you know, what you were mentioning about with, you know, when Barnett came in, the identity of this offense and, you know, Barnett guy like Jake Osina as the number one receiver seemingly. And a guy, you know, in the backfield and Stoikos, who's, uh, you know, really excited to see what he's able to do for them as well. I feel like, again, it's, it's a team that's full of uh, potential in a lot of areas, but I'll be curious to get, again, like, let's see where coach can just takes this club in terms of what they want to do. As you said, yeah, DA brings that familiarity with coach, uh, with coach Conway, with that offense. And, and again, it, it looks like, you know, 
I would assume it's or at, at the helm for them. He did seem to win that position for, I mean, he definitely won that position last year for them. Um, as far as his weapons, but but then again, as we saw that offense establish its identity with Anthony Miller, with Quentin Springer, both of whom are back. You mentioned cholera back on that O-line. Mm-hmm. And then on the flip side as well, though, you know, or we obviously saw more of that, you know, cliche as it may be, game manager type quarterback for them. Um, whereas uh, Caban was kind of just the gunslinger. But now with no James Basiliga as that number one threat. And, and regardless of how effective that running game might be, if Waterloo is going to take that next step, sure, they could. Because we, it would be, I don't think we're expecting them to be like the dominant run game. Though at times last year, their run game was as good as anyone's. Uh, it, it As far as taking a step up, it might have to, we'd have to see sort of what that passing attack looks like from them as well. And you mentioned Ryan Stewart's name. I'll be interested to see again what he can do in terms of affecting, you know, we see it, how he can affect the run game and the pass game. But when obviously Waterloo is going to have to pass at moments in this game, that secondary now with, with Kinsale Phillip, it's such an interesting thing. Cause I remember at Guelph when we had one Mikey Carney come into Guelph as a quarterback, switch over to a DB, um, you know, what was so interesting is thinking of a guy who knows how to read defenses now being able to be like, okay, I know what a quarterback's looking for. I know, mm-hmm. you know, you obviously have as good a sense as anyone of the full tree uh, route tree and combinations of things. I'm really interested. And obviously we know the athleticism Philip brings to the table with how effectively he could escape the pocket and pick up yards with his legs. I- I'm really fascinated to see where that goes in this game. But all I know for certain coming into this game is that the best thing any of these clubs do- does is Waterloo running the ball. And, you know, I, 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 with McNeil coming in to coach up that defense, Hinsberger back in the middle, we talked about obviously how it takes time for someone with that um, in depth of a playbook as McNeil can, can perhaps have. I feel like when you have a veteran at the helm, it allows you to open up some things perhaps a bit earlier uh, as well in the, in the defensive secondary, having a few guys who've been around there like Latmore. But as far as I know, going into this game, again, that can bet money on is this Waterloo team with Miller, with Springer, with guys like Cholera on that uh, O-line, they're going to want to run the ball. Uh, everything else is going to be just is is going to be new information about how these teams are playing on, on all facets. Are there any things other than that? Like, again, we have some sense of players ability, but with so many differences in this, it, it, with these two teams, as far as what they've changed, aside from that offense and that run game for Waterloo, are there any other things that you feel like, you know what, these teams we can say with, you know, a stamp of at the 55 approval, that's what their identity is going to be. Cause it feels like there's a lot of question marks with these clubs. Most definitely. The other thing that I think is is worth noting is uh, the connection. We talked about the connection, obviously, between uh, DA and Waterloo, but also with Tommy Kanichis. Kanichis was a longtime member of the Waterloo staff uh, up until I believe it was 2016 or 2017 when he finally got his uh, his opportunity to go out, maybe even longer than that. Anyways, he got his opportunity uh, to go out and be an offensive coordinator out for the St. Mary's Huskies. And he did that for a couple of years and then just most recently came back uh, to be a part of that Queens program last year and finally getting his, uh, an offensive coordinator responsibility again with Toronto. But it's not exactly like you can solve the game plan for what kind of offense they're going to be seeing. Obviously you would have seen a lot of Tommy's ideas of what he would have had while he's in that war room with Waterloo. So you've got something of a sense of who he is as a person and what's, Uh, maybe some of his calls are but since that time of as he's left he's gone to St. Mary's and he's had the chance to learn under Tom Flaxman and Steve Snyder and the rest of that Queens staff so certainly he's going to have another spin to his own offense and he's going to tailor a lot of that to what Toronto has currently with a guy like Scott Barnett, Lucas Doikos um, and uh, Jake Osin so I'm interested to see how Coach McNeil is coming at this from a defensive strategy standpoint. Obviously, you're focusing on yourself. You're trying to really understand where your strengths are as a defense when he walks into that building, understanding the bodies that he has to play with and what's what's in their best interest. 
But at some point in time, you need to look over on the other side of the ball and try to see what do we think we're going to see? Do we are, are we thinking we're going to see more of a spread offense than anything else? Do we how do we think that they're going to utilize Scott Barnett in this sense? So I'm interested to see what Coach McNeil has up his sleeves going up against uh, Coach Kanichis here and that kind of dynamic of what's happening because Tommy obviously is a bit of an unknown, at least of his last few years, because the most of it, he was out in, in the AUS. He wasn't even the same conference in some of the plays that he was running. So I'm interested to see what he brings to that, how the game plan kind of works itself out from that regard but even still even with all of these clubs and really understanding even for you know somebody like uh coach marshall and uh ron van worker and all of these other uh coordinators and coaches that have been in the oua for a long time the first game of the season is typically about establishing what you are good at and how you can really capitalize on your own strengths rather than really trying to game plan that much for another team because you know you don't know personnel or whatever else until right up at that point so I'm interested to see this U of T offense against this Waterloo defense, the new coordinators really going at it and seeing who can come out on the other side. Definitely. And I think, again, harkening back to commentary we had last year and we brought up already this year is it, whether Coach Mullen's defense, some of those things that we saw them do, especially against uh, your master mm -hmm. Marauders, which may have skewed the overall um, results at the end of the day. Like when we look at how they performed on the year um, again, is because I think you're right that that Waterloo defense, that uh, Toronto offense, assume because uh, we have a sense of what Mullins' defense can do, especially last year. Is there consistency on that front? Last thing I'll throw out as well because we didn't mention his name and he's a he's a hell of a player and a friend of the show, so worth noting. Um, though we didn't in the the tier the tier D podcast that uh, Cole Crossett is doing his mm. thing, kicking for Waterloo again which um, for a team that we put in 50-50 club, when you have as uh, consistent a leg like you do in Coles um, is huge for you. So as far as the things that we, we think we know about these clubs, I know Waterloo can run the ball really darn well, and they got a guy that they can rely on to uh, to put it through those uprights when need be. Tom, are, are you ready to make some picks in this one? I am. Let's get into it. After you, my friend. I think when you really look at things and especially hearing some of the um, the ideas that we kind of broken down, where the strengths were last year, or what we're kind of foreseeing going into this year, um, I'm going with the Waterloo Warriors to pull this one out. I think that leaning on the stable of running backs that they have to really establish their offense and try to get U of T out of place here is really what's going to be the key. We talked about it a little bit last year as well, but something to note Waterloo's go-to run game a lot of times was a lot of pulling guards, whether that's power G, counter trade, whatever you want to call it. And that takes some time to get to get going. If you have a defense that's fast enough and can recognize that if they blitz through, they can certainly disrupt things. But with Quentin Springer, with Anthony Miller, with those running backs who are back there, anchored by what we perceive most likely to be Nick Orr there as well, finding James may be gone, but Evan Basiliga was a, still a pretty solid uh, target for them amongst a few other receivers. I think this Waterloo offense helps lift uh, the Warriors to a 1-0 at home. I'm going to go Waterloo at home as well. Um, you know, again, I, I think that though by the end of the season, things will occur that, you know, may bring about a situation where Though by our tiers, we don't have either of these clubs making the playoffs. There are seven teams we have ahead of both of them. Um, in the case of U of T, technically, we have nine teams that we think are technically ahead of them. But again, to put yourself in a position where if Guelph is dealing with the injury bug again, if Ottawa with some of those question marks we had isn't quite there yet, Mac, weird things are going on there. This is a game that matters so much if there's a situation for one of these teams to sneak in Waterloo. They had the advantage last year. They run the ball really well and they have this one at home. I'm really excited for what this U of T offense can do. And I think they'll put up points and that wouldn't surprise me if they can go on the road and take this game. DA's return and his star as the head coach. But from everything we know right now, it's Waterloo at home. That is a wrap on the week one preview pod there, Tom. Um, Man, oh man, uh, like we 
I, I can't, I don't know anything else, any stones that we've left unturned other than some of the question marks on these rosters um, that will come to fruition that again, by the time you're hearing this, those questions may have been answered again, just give us the grace of recognizing that we are recording this a few days in the past of when you may be hearing this. Um, any last thoughts before we call this one a wrap and go into week one? Thank goodness OUA football is back. You and I have been looking forward to this. Honestly, the moment that the Vanier Cup is over, we're already looking to next year. We're looking forward to watching these teams get after it once again, and it's finally here. I'm so excited to see all the matchups that we have here. Once again, I mentioned it on a couple of the tier, two, uh, the tier pods. I'm saying this on the preview pod. Praying to the football gods that will listen to us. Let's keep everybody healthy. We want to see the best of the best across the country here do their thing. Please, for the love of God, keep everyone healthy. Let's see some great football. Welcome back, OUA. I couldn't have said it better myself, my friend. As a recap, Tom and I are going to be in the Royal City to watch Carlton do battle with the Guelph Griffins and then heading down Highway 6 to watch the reigning OUA MVP take on your McMaster Marauders at Ron Joyce while staying plugged into that Windsor Queens game and then looking forward to a beautiful slate of football on the Sunday to follow up. What more could you want, my friends? Thank you for tuning in. As always, we will, of course, break down all these games, everything that happens after the weekend's done. You can check us out right here 